to begin, I would like to introduce uh, the York International team. First, we have Eugene Lee, who is the International Student Experience Coordinator. And I am Gagan, and I work alongside with my colleagues Anika and Sarah. So now that uh, so now that you guys uh, know me about me and my team, it's time to get to know each other in the room and find some commonality amongst us. I will be showing some uh, questions uh, one by one on screen, and you will have to answer these questions. Uh, but there is a twist. You can answer the questions uh, with only one emoji available in the chat feature. And if you cannot find an emoji, uh, you can uh, find an emoji that is closest to your answer. And in I encourage you to be as fast and as prompt as possibly you can while answering these uh, questions. So let's begin. The first question for you is, how are you feeling today? Perfect. And the second question for you guys is, what is your favorite season? Perfect. And the next question is, What's the last emoji that you recently used while texting? And the next question is, describe today's weather in just one emoji. Perfect. And the next question for you is, have you gone to a doctor in Canada? It's like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And the last question is, um, Describe with an emoji, how do you feel about seeing a doctor in Canada? I definitely agree with some of the emojis. Like even me, I'm pretty nervous when I go to a doctor. So I totally get that. Okay, so let's let's get started. So by the end of this workshop. Uh, it is our hope that students will have more knowledge about the process of finding a preferred healthcare provider and learn in depth on what to expect during your first healthcare visit. And students can also get to learn about some basic terminologies that are commonly used in the healthcare system in Canada. And lastly, understand the various steps involved after your uh, first healthcare visit. And in terms of agenda for today, we will be talking about uh, how do we navigate the Canadian health system and which would be followed by it, which would followed be by then a small group activity. And lastly, I will shed some light on some upcoming uh, York International events. So if I can give the room to our presenters. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ayan. I'm one of the public health nurses. Um, I work out of the Student Counseling Health and Wellbeing team in the Bennett Center. Um, so my role really 
is to, um, I've been working in public health now for about four years. So I've worked in the municipal and federal levels of government. Um, I've worked with diverse populations across the lifespan and I'm committed to advocating for the unique health needs of vulnerable and marginalized communities. Um, my role at York University is to provide initiatives that promote health equity, disease prevention, and health promotion for students. Um, I help to support the health and well-being of students by ensuring they have the health education and services available to them to live a healthier and more balanced life. Um, I'll take it over to my colleague, Simran, who's in the photo with me. Thanks, Ayan. Hi, everyone. My name is Simran. I'm also a registered nurse. I have five years um, work experience in our healthcare system, spanning from acute care to public health to infection control. My particular interests are in epidemiology, infectious diseases, as well as preventive, uh, preventive, uh, preventative care and health education. In my role at York, much like I am, I'm committed to making sure that health education resources and services are available and accessible to students so that everyone on campus is empowered to make the best decisions for their health and well-being. Now, before we get into the Canadian healthcare system, uh, as far as acute care and primary care goes, we'd like to take a second just to talk a little bit about what public health is, seeing as we're both public health nurses. So when you go to a hospital or when you go to a primary care clinic, you are the patient. In public health, it's a little bit different. We see the population as the patient rather than the individual. And so that, again, comes back to our goal here is that we're looking out for the health of the population. These populations can be organized by geographical area. So, for example, the city of Toronto or by other communities. So, for instance, when we look at new moms, that's a community that we may want to focus on. Public health initiatives aren't always felt immediately, except in the case of COVID, in which case I think our lockdowns and stuff were felt pretty much immediately by everyone. But generally, public health likes to play the long game to make sure that everyone is able to live a healthier life, maybe even without realizing it. So some examples include infectious disease prevention and control. So we wanna prevent infectious diseases from spreading in our communities. Part of that includes mass vaccination efforts. So vaccinations in school, annual flu vaccinations, as well as uh, booster shots, like for your tetanus uh, vaccines, improvements to sanitation and reduction of environmental toxins. So we have a great sewage system. Part of that uh, is public health to thank for that. Motor vehicle safety, so the use of car seats, the use of seat belts, as well as disease prevention. So early cancer screening, cardiovascular health education, diabetes prevention and health education, improved maternal and fetal health. So public health uh, nurses will sometimes do health teaching to expecting moms or new moms, as well as to parents and also harm reduction initiatives. And those can take many, uh, many forms, whether it comes to sexual health, whether it comes to substance use. So a little bit about public health, just to give you a background on what Ayan and I are doing on campus essentially. And I will now pass it back to Ayan to dive into our presentation topic for today. Thank you so much. Okay, so today we're gonna be discussing the Canadian healthcare system, how to navigate it, uh, what to expect at your first appointment and answer any questions you may have. Uh, so we like to start things off with a video just to give you a brief understanding before we really dive in. Uh, so there is a link. Ian, I think you're muted. Sorry guys, so you didn't hear anything I said, right? Okay. So today we're gonna be uh, walking you through the Canadian healthcare system, uh, what to expect at your first appointment and answer any questions that you guys might have. Uh, so we like to th start things off with a video. Uh, so I added it to the chat, but I'm gonna see if I can quickly play it and share my screen. So just give me a second.
Are you guys able to see my screen at all? We're able to see your screen, but we can't see your video. Okay. Simran, can you try for me uh, to play the video? Uh, yeah, one second. Thank you. Are you able to see the video now? Okay. Yes. Sorry, Simon, can you click play? I have the loading wheel. I, I've clicked it, it's just loading. I'm not sure what's going on. Canada has been recognized worldwide for its publicly funded healthcare system, providing universal coverage for medically necessary. Sorry, guys, just bear with us. I'm going to try again on my end. Are you guys able to see in here? Yes, yeah. we can see in here. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Providing universal coverage for medically necessary health care services to all Canadians. Also, the first bit. This national health insurance And the audio is very choppy. Sales taxes. Is it? Okay, one second. You know what? I'll just keep it in the chat and we can try again later. Um, but we'll head back into the presentation. And share. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so a huge misconception is that Canada has free health care. However, this only refers to those who are insured. In Ontario, Canadians and permanent residents are insured under OHIP, so that's Ontario Health Insurance Plan. And this plan covers basic uh, hospital doctor visits, medically necessary surgeries, diagnostic tests, and some medication. As international students, you are insured under UHIP, which is University Health Insurance Plan. And UHIP covers the same basic health plan um, that OHIP does. Um, um, uh, something to remember is that OHIP does not cover prescription drugs provided in non-hospital settings, such as antibiotics from your family doctor, dental services, eyeglasses, etc. You would need supplemental insurance for that. So for example, as a Canadian living in Ontario, I have OHIP, 
Um, and as a York employee, I have access to benefits through a personal health and in health insurance plan that covers some of these costs for antibiotics, dental care, and vision. We'll go into more detail later. Um, one thing to remember is as international students, you'll have coverage under your extended health plan. So that's either through YFS if you're an undergrad student or GSA. Uh, again, not to worry, we'll cover this in the later slides. Okay. So what happens first? So primary care. So primary care in Canada serves two different functions. It provides direct provision of primary health care services and coordinates health care services for patients to ensure continuity of care and ease of movement throughout the health care system. Primary care services can include prevention, prevention and treatment of common diseases and injuries, uh, basic emergency services, um, referring patients to different uh, specialties and services, um, primary mental health care, palliative or end of life care, uh, healthy child development, primary maternity care, and rehab services. Uh, when necessary, patients who require further diagnosis or treatment, they're referred to other health services, specialist care, or diagnostic testing. Uh, one thing to remember, in, in Canada, we work through a referral process. So typically, you would go and see your family uh, physician or nurse practitioner, and, and, and during that assessment, they will then refer you to a specialist if required. So say, for example, I went to my doctor, and I wasn't feeling well, and I just, I was really having a lot of chest pain and just um, discomfort and my blood work came back and there was some issues related to uh, some of my levels and at that point they referred me over to do an ECG so just to examine my heart and see my heart rate and what's going on with my heart in general um, at that point when that test results come back the doctor may see hey Ayan, I think you need to go see a cardiologist your blood pressure might be a little bit elevated um, your ECG doesn't look too good so at that point they would refer me over to a specialist I know in other parts of the world things might look a little bit different if you know that you have have heart issues or cardiovascular issues, you would go straight and see a cardiologist. But in Canada, um, the family doctors or NPs are kind of like our gatekeepers. So you kind of have to go through primary care first in order for them to be seen by a specialist. Next slide. Primary care providers. So family physicians or nurse practitioners are your primary care providers. They are the people you see when you have a non-emergent health concern. Um, nurse practitioners are healthcare providers who completed a graduate level of clinical education that allows them to practice autonomous, autonomously, so alone. So NPs are um, registered nurses who then completed um, a graduate program that allows them then to utilize their unique uh, nursing uh, perspective in regards to your health. They focus on health promotion, health education, and patient-centered care. With their advanced education in medical sciences, NPs are able to provide rigorous evidence-based health care. So they have very, very similar roles to physicians. Uh, they may work independently or work with a primary care team. Um, they can work in community health centers, uh, family health teams. So if you think about like Black Creek Community Health Center that's nearby or Apple Tree, um, you may see a, a nurse practitioner or a physician. So both NPs and physicians can diagnose and treat acute conditions. They can order uh, some blood work, manage chronic conditions like diabetes or high blood pressure. They can write prescriptions, provide regular checks up, checkups like your physicals and routine screenings. And they would they can also refer you to a secondary or specialist care if needed. Uh, next slide. Types of primary care. So we have family health practice, which is the first point of contact for for most individuals, and they provide direct primary health care and coordinate, and coordinate health services across the lifespan. We also have walk-in clinics, so they provide medical care for those without primary health care provider or for those unable to reach the primary health care provider right away. Um, sometimes appointments are not needed, but wait times can be long. Uh, so say, for example, I have a cold, I'm not feeling well, my doctor's unavailable, I would Google the nearest walk-in clinic near me and go there. Um, Typically, wait times are long, so bring a book, 
bring your phone, go on TikTok. Um, we also have urgent care. So for urgent care, uh, but not emergent health concerns. So for example, if you're, um, say you cut yourself, it's a small cut. Uh, you know you may need stitches, you would go to an urgent care. Uh, so they can diagnose and treat and treat if available from healthcare providers. Hours and wait times may vary. Uh, some are open 24 hours a day, but others are not. Appointments are not always necessary. Emergency. So for em emergent or life-threatening illnesses or injuries, they are open 24 hours a day, every day, seven days a week, even during the holidays. Appointments are not needed. Um, and then we have telehealth. So are also known as Health 811. It's a confidential health advice provided by registered nurses through the phone or chat. If you're unsure what to do or where to go, they can provide guidance or direct you to services if needed. They're also available 24 hours a day, every day. Uh, so I really like telehealth when um, I wanna talk to a nurse, get some advice, but I don't wanna be on the phone all the time. Um, so it's a nice chat feature as well if you don't wanna be on the phone. Next slide. Uh, so now this is a really nice picture to kind of let you know uh, the difference between primary versus um, urgent versus emergent care and where to go. So, for example, if I just wanted a checkup, um, medication, uh, management of my symptoms, I can go see my primary care provider. So my doctor, uh, say I sprained my ankle or I had an allergic reaction, um, my doctor's not available. Um, I need to be seen kind of urgently, but I know it's not necessarily emergent. I would then go see, go to urgent care. Um, I would go to the emergency room or urgent care for immediate, um, to be seen immediately. For example, say I'm having a baby, I'm having difficulty breathing, I broke a bone, um, I got burned. So think about things that are emergent, you need to be seen right away. You would then visit an emergency room. Um, it's really important because of our healthcare system, there's a lot of pressures. So it's really important that you know where to go and where to be seen right away. Next slide. So what happens next? So uh, secondary services, let's talk about specialized care. So this can be done in the community or in the hospital. Uh, your primary care provider may have to do certain tests before referring you to a specialist care in the hospital. So if you remember my previous example of, of me having some cardiovascular or heart problems, my doctor usually would first um, do some blood work, uh, order maybe an ECG just to examine my heart rate and rhythm, and then would refer me to a specialist, so the cardiologist if needed. Uh, so this can include seeing a dermatologist, for example, if you're having some skincare issues, um, they can also send you over to do some diagnostic testing, like an echocardiogram that I mentioned before. Uh, we have long-term chronic care, so medical and non-medical care for individuals who cannot care for themselves for long periods of time. And then we have home care for individuals requiring support at home from healthcare providers, but do not necessarily require hospitalization. So think about people out in the community, like the elderly people um, say that they're able to care for themselves, but they just need extra support at home. Um, they would have uh, personal support workers come over, um, help them with cleaning, cooking, um, chores, things of that nature. Next slide. Perfect. So international student health insurance. So as I mentioned before, we have UHIP. So in lieu of OHIP, so instead of OHIP, international students have UHIP that provides basic health services um, for international students. This is administered by York International. And some services require pre-approval, so just double check. Um, this presentation will be given to you guys at the end, so you will be able to click the links. Um, and then this premium is paid through your student account. We then have the extended health plan. So this is through YFS or UGSA. Uh, this is services that are not covered by UHIP. So students have this extra supplemental coverage. Um, and again, it's through YFS or GSA, depending on if you're undergrad or graduate student. And this premium is also paid uh, through your student account. So again, UHIP, for example, you would use to go visit your doctor, go to the emergency if you need. Um, and then you would use your extended health plan for things like dental care, vision, um, prescriptions from your doctor. So it's really important that you differentiate 
and change it to. Uh, most students are automatically enrolled in the plan. However, students should always check their student account statement to confirm enrollment before seeking or undergoing treatment or purchasing services or medication. So just always double check um, that you're enrolled. Next slide. Perfect. So additional supplementary services. So here's a list that I mentioned before that would be covered through your extended healthcare plan. So again, things like prescription drugs, dental, vision, medical equipment. Um, if you wanted to see a chiropractor, if you wanted to seek a therapist, these are generally covered for individuals through their extended health plan. Um, next slide. Next. Perfect. Okay. Finding a healthcare provider. So how do we do that? So we have preferred providers. Let's go to the next one. Preferred providers are physicians, clinics, labs, and other healthcare providers uh, that can save you money by billing the insurance company directly at UHIP rates. So again, for international students who have UHIP, um, it's really important that you provide you um, find a preferred provider to avoid uh, paying beforehand. They would bill the insurance company directly, and they will ask you to complete an authorization form at your first visit, which will then directly allow them to bill the insurance company. Um, they may also ask you for a copy of your UHIP card. Uh, preferred providers are not supposed to request upfront payment from students who will, when presented with a physical copy of the UHIP card. Again, that's a physical copy. So always ensure when you're going to the doctor um, that you have your UHIP card um, with you at all times. Sometimes um, I know people like to have a picture or digital version of it. But again, it's really important that you have a physical copy to ensure that you're not paying out of pocket. And uh, the only exception is Apple Tree Clinics that may charge you $15 admin fee. Um, that's just their policy. And here's a link um, within the presentation where you can find preferred providers. Next one, Health 811. So it's free, it's secure, it's a confidential service that Ontarians can access 24 hours a day, seven days a week to receive health advice from a registered nurse. Um, they can help you locate lo uh, local health services and find trusted health information. So they can help you find different health services, um, assess your symptoms, you can get some health advice, um, you'll have access to search the medical library. Uh, so again, it's a really nice resource that's also available to international students uh, and it's free and confidential. Next slide. 211 Central. So 211 Central provides information on community and government services available in the Toronto, Durham, Peel, and York region. So pretty much the entire greater Toronto area. Uh, health services include finding community health centers or um, medical providers, uh, pregnancy care, programs for individuals with disabilities, locating nearest walking clinics and emergency rooms and more. So typically you would just put in your address or your postal code and it will direct you to the services available to you in your area. Uh, services are available by calling or texting 211 or through the live chat on their website. Uh, you can live chat and text services. They're available Monday to Friday, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Next slide. Okay, long wait times. So specialist services in Ontario can have a wait time which are not always common in other countries. And when I say wait times, I mean a long wait time. In Ontario, it's not uncommon to wait three to six months for something like an MRI, a CT scan, or other specialized tests. Uh, specialist services are on a triage basis, which means it's it's not always first come first served. So they triage based on emergent and urgent issues. So say for example, you went into the hospital because you are having a cold, you shouldn't go to the hospital for a cold right away, you go to your doctor or urgent care if you need to or a walking clinic. Um, somebody who comes in with a gunshot wound, for example, or um, a heart attack will be prioritized, you probably won't be seen within the next five to six hours. So 
always determine your symptoms and then go to use uh, access the right services based on your symptoms. It's also common to wait an additional 20 to 30 minutes after your scheduled appointment. So say for example, um, I went to my family doctor because I've been having a cold the last couple of days and it's just not getting any better. I make an appointment. I have my UHIP card ready with me. I make my appointment for 9 a.m. I go in on time for 9 a.m. I'm probably not going to be seen until 9.30, 10 a.m., even though my appointment was at 9. Um, so it's important to arrive on time um, and you might not be seen right away due to the unexpected increase in patients your doctor is seeing or your nurse practitioner is seeing. There could be staffing issues. Um, you don't know other people's health issues, so they could have a more complex issue than you, so they'll probably be prioritized. Uh, so always, again, bring a book, um, maybe get some work done if you're up for it. Emergency rooms and urgent cares may also have long wait times, three to four hours. These services also work on triage basis. So again, you'll be prioritized based on emergency level. Uh, so a bit about my, sorry, if you can just go back to the other side. Um, if I can provide just a brief example um, that I have. So I'm someone who struggles with chronic migraines, so headaches. Uh, Tylenol and Advil doesn't always work all the time for me. So I went to my doctor. I um, mentioned my symptoms. I've done my blood work. It came back fine. I've done my annual physical. I'm pretty much healthy, but I'm still having these headaches. And it's been a couple years. Uh, they just haven't gotten any better or any worse. So uh, my doctor has recommended that I get an MRI. So what happens is my doctor will then send the referral over to the hospital closest to me uh, for me to do an MRI. So when they called me to book the appointment, I was booking for six months in advance, six, within six months. So I did it last year. I think I called around January. I didn't have my MRI until I believe July. Uh, so it's not unusual to wait that long for things like an MRI or CT scan if it's not necessarily emergent. Um, again, so when I booked that appointment, it was for July. So it's really important that you know you would be free within that time period that you're booking the appointment. I know it's hard to kind of know your schedule uh, six months from now, but say for example, I needed to reschedule it, it would be probably another four to six months. So it's just something that uh, you should keep in mind when it comes to things like uh, specialty diagnostic testings, like an MRI or a CT scan. Next slide, please. First primary care provider visit. Next. So you're not feeling well, now what? So based on your symptoms or concerns, you need to determine where to, uh, where you would go. Uh, so a primary care provider or a walk-in clinic, urgent care, or the ER. Always ensure you have a copy of your UHIP or what your UHIP and your YFS insurance. If you're taking any prescription medication, supplement, herbal medication, bring a list of what you take with you um, to your first visit. Um, I know sometimes people might think they might not to mention herbs or vitamins that they're taking, but it's really important that you, you tell your primary care provider because they can actually contradict other medications that they might prescribe you. So you might not think anything of it, but just always in, um, inform your healthcare provider of anything you're taking. If available, bring uh, documentation of any health history with you uh, to your primary care provider and so they can have a comprehensive understanding of your health history and current health needs. Um, a pro tip is to keep a symptom diary. Write down if you're experiencing any symptoms, when they started, for how long, rate your pain, um, and if your symptoms are getting any better or worse. This will help you during your appointment to kind of keep you on track. Next slide, advocating for yourself. So we're gonna talk a bit about Ontario health regulations. So when you see a regulated, regulated healthcare professional in Ontario, you can expect to receive up-to-date information about the professional uh, using the online listing available on each healthcare uh, regulatory's website. So for, for physicians or doctors, you can click the link for a CPSO, find a doctor, and that will give you all the information in regards to your doctor. For a nurse practitioner, you can visit Find a Nurse on the College of Nurses of Ontario. Um, and that again, will give you a, a, the information for your NP. 
a clear explanation of any proposed treatment or procedure and your consent will be obtained. You can accept or refuse any treatment or procedure and you can ask questions and express your concerns. Um, an indication of any fees or costs for the services should also be informed to you right away. Always ask. Um, and in addition, you will be treated as a partner in making decisions about your health care. It's really important to remember that doctors, nurse practitioners, um, nurses in general, just people in healthcare, our aim is to really ensure that we're providing um, you with the best health and information as possible, help you navigate the healthcare system, address your concerns, the best intentions. But again, you know your body the best. So we're really looking to the patient to express those concerns to us so that we can provide um, the optimal patient care. Uh, you will be treat treated, your treatment will be given safety. You will be treated with respect and understanding. You, sh uh, you should have information about what to do if your health changes or worsens. Your personal health information will remain confidential and you can contact an Ontario health regulator to talk about any concerns or make it a, a complaint if needed. Next slide. So common medical terminology. BP means blood pressure. So if you have ever heard a doctor or a nurse say, oh, your BP is kind of high, that means your blood pressure. Heart rate, uh, HR, O2 is your oxygen level or saturation. Temp is temperature. RR is respiratory rate. BMI is body mass index. Biopsy, a small sample of tissues that that's taken for testing to discover the cause or extent of a disease. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Hypotension is low blood pressure. CT is computer tomography scan, MRI, magnetic renaissance imaging. Acute disease or condition, a condition that starts suddenly, it may be severe, but it's often short term. Chronic disease condition is a condition that is long lasting and reoccurring. The term chronic is used when the disease lasts more than three months. So for example, an appendicitis is an acute condition whereas something like type two, type one diabetes is a chronic lifelong condition. Next slide, please. Best practices and tips. So we would highly, highly recommend keeping copies of all your receipts related to medical expenses that you may need for reimbursement later on. Keep a list of prescription medication, supplements, herbal medication, including the dosage and how frequently you're taking them. Ensure you are providing your healthcare provider with as much information regarding your health concerns. The more detail, the better they will be able to support you. Uh, make a list and prioritize your concerns. Um, consider bringing a family member or a trusted friend to your appointment for moral support. Request an interpreter if needed. Next slide. So before we get into the activity, I'm just going to quickly um, share that we do have an NP on the line, Alicia Munasar, who's actually Simonize manager. Uh, so she kind of see, uh, sees over um, all student health in at York University. So if I can just quickly give her the floor. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I wasn't... Um... I wasn't expecting to, to speak today, but thank you, Ayan, so much. Um, Alicia Munasara, as Ayan said, I am a nurse practitioner by background. I've been in healthcare now for about 20 years um, and just wanted to let folks know if you have questions about the healthcare system or if you have questions about yourself, to please feel free to connect, reach out. Uh, Eugene has my information. Gargan, I'll make sure you have my information as well for students who may have questions about just concerns about themselves or, or navigating the system. Please reach out to myself, Simran, or Ian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Alicia. Okay. And I'll pass it over to Simran, who will kind of go through the scenarios with us. Thank you. Um, am I joined by Amir? Hi, everyone. Um, so we're just going to go through a scenario of I have an injury and then where should I go? Um, so I was walking home after my classes and I slipped and uh, slipped on some ice on the stairs to my house and I twisted my knee. 
So I am in a lot of pain, um, but I don't know where I should get checked. Does anyone have any idea of where I should go? Okay, so I do see urgent care, so we'll get back to that. So I didn't know where to go, so I decided to call Health 811, which is the telehealth, to see where, um, to get their opinion. Um, so me and my colleague Jennifer are just going to do a little like role play of the call. Um, so hi, thank you for calling Health 811. How can I help you today? Hi, I was walking home from school and I slipped on some ice on my uh, on the stairs to my house. I twisted my knee and I'm in a lot of pain, but I don't know where to go. If I should go to my primary health care provider, uh, to urgent care, or to the emergency. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm going to ask you some questions to further understand. Can you rate your pain on a scale from 0 to 10, with 0 being no pain and 10 being the worst pain you have ever felt? Um. So right now, my pain is around a 7 out of 10. Okay. Is your knee swollen or is there any redness or bruising? Um, so my knee is a little swollen and red, but there isn't any bruising. Okay. Did you hear any sound when you slipped, such as pop or crack? Uh, so no, I didn't hear anything when I fell. Okay. Are you able to put any weight on your leg or bend your leg? Um, so I am able to put weight on it and bend my leg a little, but it does hurt a lot when I do so. Okay, I'm too I'm sorry to hear that. From uh I'm sorry to hear that. From what you have told me, it looks like you may have sprained your knee. Uh I would recommend you go to an urgent care clinic for further assessment to help with your pain. In the meantime, you can take uh Tylenol or Adwell. Okay, thank you for your help. So yes, you guys in the chat, I did see urgent care. So you guys were correct. I should go to urgent care to get my knee checked out. Um, so some exam like if I had, let's say, thought I'd broken my bone or I can see that the bone is broken, then I would go to emergency because that's a bit of a higher, um, a bit more risk, a higher risk. So we need to make sure that gets checked out. So then I arrived at urgent care and I saw a doctor and they ordered for me to get an x-ray. So I went and got my x-ray done and then I came back to see the doctor after that. So the doctor told me that they think I may have a like a small tear in some part of my knee. Um, so they're going to refer me to get an MRI done and a surgeon. So will I get the MRI right away? You guys can type your answers in the chat. So yes, that is correct. I won't get the MRI right away, and I also won't also won't see the surgeon for quite a while. As Ayan had said earlier in the presentation, referrals can take up to, can take from three to six months. And as her given her personal example, MRI can take up to six months. So basically, I'm going to have to wait. They'll call me, give me an appointment time, and then I go in to get my MRI done. And then after that, I would see the surgeon. So if what should I do if I get um if I my pain gets worse? Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah, so I can go to, if my pain gets a lot worse, then I can go to emergency. If it is also manageable, I can also go see my doctor again and say, look, my pain has gotten worse and see if there's anything they can do to speed up the process. As Ayan had said earlier, that the MRI and specialist referral is on a triage basis. So they treat patients based on their need. So then the doctor can go back, update the referral, or they can refer me to a different specialist who may have less of, uh, might have a lower, less wait time. So the main thing is to remember that the primary care provider will do all the necessary tests first and then refer you to a specialist, which in my case would be a surgeon. Um, as Ayana stated earlier, in Canada, you need a referral to see a specialist. You can book an appointment with them directly. And yeah, so that's the end of the scenario. Thanks, Samir. This is a really good scenario, and especially in the winter, I think it's quite common. We have a lot of slips, trips, and falls uh, in this season, so everyone watch your step. But the triage basis also, I'd like to add, happens not just on how emergent the concern is, but also how it can be fixed. So like in Amir's scenario, there was a tear in some part of the knee, if that tear can be fixed with a better outcome earlier on rather than waiting a little bit, he might be prioritized. 
If that tear we can wait a little bit, if it's really not going to make a difference, then he may be pushed to a little bit lower in the list. So to give everyone an example, my partner had an arm injury uh, a few months ago, a few years, months ago, and he tore the short head of his bicep. He went to emergency. We were referred to an orthopedic surgeon. We got an appointment with an orthopedic surgeon within two weeks. And that's because with that specific injury, if it's fixed right away, there's a better outcome versus if we wait a little bit longer. And so again, it also depends on the type of injury and the severity of the injury. And wait times also fluctuate, you know, depending on the time of year. We have different people presenting to the hospital with different needs at various times of the year. So I think there's some research, and Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong, but the incidences of heart attacks um, go up around the holidays or around the summer when people are a little bit more stressed or exerting themselves a little bit more you know, broken bones go up a little bit during either the summer when people are more active or in the winter when they fall. But the number of healthcare providers we have and the number of hospital rooms we have stays the same. So wait times can also fluctuate depending on the injury and the uh, time of year. So now we're going to move to a kind of rapid fire true and false uh, scenario. And if my slides will change. Perfect. So I have four questions here. We'll take them one at a time. Please put your answers in the chat. So true or false, a disease that lasts three or more months is an acute disease. Okay, Kagan says true. So it's actually false. So like Diane mentioned earlier, acute illnesses are usually sudden onset, usually um, short term. Anything that lasts three or more months is generally considered chronic. So for example, type one or type two diabetes, those are long-term illnesses. So question number two, a nurse practitioner is just as qualified as a physician to diagnose and treat health conditions. True, perfect. So I see two truths and that is correct. They have different training. Their scope of practice is a little bit different, but quite similar, but they are both qualified healthcare providers, especially in the community. If you go to, for example, a family health practice, you're just as likely to see a nurse practitioner as you are a physician, and they will provide you with near identical care. And in the hospital, if you go to an emergency room or if you go to a specialist, uh, specialized service, you may also see nurse practitioners working there. This is something that, as far as I know, is quite unique to North America. I think Australia and England may have some nurse practitioners as well. But because they're not very common in a lot of other countries, we want to highlight that they exist, that they are qualified medical pro uh, providers, and that they are different from physicians and they are different from registered nurses. So number three, I can use my UHIP card to cover the cost of dental care. So if I need a cleaning or if I have a cavity and need a filling, I can use UHIP to cover that. Is that true or false? Okay, false, that is correct. So UHIP covers everything that OHIP covers and OHIP does not cover dental care unless it's dental care that you require while you are in the hospital. Outside of that, dental care is covered generally through an extended health plan or out of pocket. So for students, if you are an undergraduate student, that would be your York Federation of Student uh, Health Plan. Or if you're a graduate student, it would be the Graduate Student Association Health Plan. And you can look at, uh, once the PowerPoint is provided to you, you can click on the links and see how much is covered uh, for dental care, for vision care, for anything you may need to use. And now number four, and this was a question that was asked um, previously as well by a student, but I was using medication in my home country that is not available in Canada. So I'm allowed to import that medication into Canada for my use. Is that true or false? That's correct, that is also false. So 
When you are coming into Canada, if you have a prescription, then you can bring prescription medication into the country with you. It has to be medication for yourself. It can't be medication for anybody else. After that, once you're in Canada, you're living in Canada, you cannot import medication from another country into Canada, even if you have a prescription. And that is because Health Canada does not allow it because they can't guarantee the safety or the efficacy of medications. In this case, you would speak to your physician and see if there's anything in Canada that is the equivalent of what you were taking in your home country. So sometimes it's easy. If you were taking paracetamol for something, and for example, India, you can take acetaminophen here. They're almost identical. I think they are identical. Sometimes it's a little bit trickier. If you have an illness that can only be controlled by medication available to you outside of Canada, in very specific circumstances, Health Canada may grant you an exemption to bring that medication in. Outside of that, that is not allowed. So thank you everyone for participating. That's the last of our, our rapid-ish fire true and false. And now we're going to move on to question and answer. Does anyone have any questions right off the bat uh, that we can answer? Alicia, I see your hand up, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really appreciating the presentation. I just want to add just just one quick um, point of advice for folks on the line, um, and it's with regards to um, English being, you know, a second language and having any kind of language barriers. I also want to just make mention that there are medical translators that are available or interpretation services. These services do play an essential role in improving patient safety as well as the standard of care. Um, a lot of times because of language barriers and, and other pieces, cultural, um, you know, impositions, there can be misunderstandings and incorrect diagnosis and or treatments that could cause harm to patients because of language barriers. And so um, at all costs, we want to ensure that we are avoiding this. So I just wanted to remind folks on the line that we do have medical interpreters available. So if at any point you feel like your medical practitioner, whether it be an NP or a physician or whomever within the system is not having a good understanding or you feel like you're not getting the answers that you need and you, you don't have that, compre that comprehension or understanding to please reach out and ask because these services are, I, I wanna say rapidly available in most healthcare facilities. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to say, but thanks. Thanks, Alicia. And that's a very good point. And that comes back to one of your rights uh, as a patient in Ontario, you have the right to understand what is happening. And informed consent can't happen unless you understand what is happening. Um, so I see a question from Anika, but I saw Sajid's hand up first. So Sajid, let's start with you and then Anika will go to your question. Hi, uh, thank you. So I had a, I'm a master's student. I just arrived in Canada in January. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, I haven't received any communication regarding the UHIP or the uh, YUG, GSA plan. Uh, so I was wondering, do I have to sign up for this? Uh, what's the process for me to, you know, get, get the, make sure that I, I'm, I am covered? So I believe we have somebody on the line that can speak to the insurance plan directly if they're available. Yeah. So I believe the question was regarding UHIP enrollment. Um, if if I, I can speak from the perspective of UHIP, if you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student, uh, an international student who's registered active in courses and currently enrolled in courses at York, we get a prompt on our side of the system and we're able to directly enroll you into UHIP. Uh, I'm not sure about the process for the YUGSA or the YFS, Extended Health Plan Enrollment for UHIP. You just need to be enrolled and registered active in courses. Uh, for YUGSA, Sajid, uh, there's an email address that is included. When you click the link in the presentation, there's an email address and you can email them to confirm your enrollment and ask them uh, more about where you can get your enrollment card. So that link will be provided to you at the end of the presentation. And okay, then 
one thing to remember is as a graduate student, you're automatically enrolled into the program. So I think it's just for you emailing them and obtaining that card from them. Uh, again, we'll send you guys a presentation. It's going to have all the links and then you can email them directly to get that. All right, thank you. And this next question, I'm going to pass on to Alicia. Alicia, can you explain to us what is the main difference between a nurse practitioner and a family physician? Yeah, so for sure. So thank you so much for asking that question. I think um, in healthcare, the role of nurse practitioners are quite integral. Um, for decades, you know, nurses have been providing um, you know, they've been working, I want to say, in, in various scopes of practice. Um, and we see now that nurse practitioner care has been shown to be comparable to that of general practitioners or physicians. Uh, there are a lot of benefits with regards to the role in terms of cost effectiveness and being able to produce high quality of care. I would say that one of the major differences is our educational um, background. So, of course, becoming a physician is quite extensive. The years of study, um, studies, I want to say, is, is is quite lengthy. And so for nurse practitioners, you must have an undergraduate. Um, now the um, competency or educational requirement is also changing. So NPs within Canada in the next few years will also be required to have a doctoral degree in order to practice as a nurse practitioner. In terms of our scope, so I would say one of the major differences is our educational backgrounds. Um, but as it relates to our scope, our scope is quite similar. So as I am to mentioned previously, um, we are and can autonomously and independently diagnose, order all um, laboratory um, requirements similar to physicians, um, order all tests like medical imaging in terms of x-rays, MRIs, CTs, um, Dopplers, you name it, prescribe all medications with the exception of um, cannabinoids, um, and there's one more that I can't remember right now, but there's two medications that we are unable to, to order with the exception of those two, we can pretty much order anything, um, similar to what a physician can order. So our scope are pretty much the same, uh, the, de the designation, of course, being a, a, an MD versus an NP is, is very different and the, the years of study, um, is different. So those are some of the pieces that I would say are, are quite different, but in terms of similarities, we are are working towards, you know, again, achieving high quality care and ensuring that we are improving patient safety outcomes. Hopefully that answers your question. Perfect. Thanks, Alicia. No problem. And for Sajid, I see that Eugene has put the email for YUGSA in the chat. So if you email them, they'll be able to provide you with more information. Does anyone else have any other questions? To our presenters and our students, anything to add? Um, oh, I see a hand up. Sajid? Yes, Sajid. Yeah, sorry, uh, just one more question. Uh, say, uh, actually two questions. So do I need to sign up for a preferred network first? before I can avail healthcare or uh, is it uh, automatically selected? And the other question is, say I need to go to a dermatologist, right? It's like a skin problem, but do I need to go to my uh, family physician first or can I just directly go to a dermatologist? Thank you. Um, so two really good questions, Sajid. Uh, so first of all, you do not need to sign up for a preferred provider or a preferred network before you seek health care. If you need care, you can go seek it immediately. The only difference between the preferred providers and the not preferred providers is that the non-preferred providers will bill you up front. So they will charge you money um, right at your appointment and you have to then submit it to the insurance company for reimbursement. A preferred provider will not charge you money. They will bill uh, the insurance company directly. So you can go to a clinic of your choice, but that is the difference between preferred and not preferred. Um, as well, walk-in clinics will take you immediately, but if you are looking for a family care provider, so like a dedicated family doctor or a family nurse practitioner, that could take a little bit longer. But again, walk-in clinics are available. And Alicia? 
Yeah, sorry if I may just jump in here as well for you. Um, and if you are looking for a preferred uh, preferred provider, what you can do is you can go on to Healthcare Connect. We're happy to provide you with this resource. If you go on to help help on to help care connect um, you're able to find a doctor or nurse practitioner um, if you know of someone uh, by referral and actually you can type in your information there and then from there log in to make an appointment um, with regards to your second question I think Simran answered it but I'll just re reaffirm that you would definitely require a referral to see a dermatologist um, in Ontario just a I quick think that Sorry. Um, and just to quickly add, that's with any type of referral. So if you wanted to go see a cardiologist, then you know you have previous heart issues. Again, you would need to see a family physician or NP and then be referred. Uh, so again, just think about it. It's, it's a little bit like gatekeeping. You got to go through one door to open all the other doors. I think the only exception to that is cosmetic procedures. So if you're looking to have something cosmetic done, then you do not require a referral, but that's also not covered by UHIP or your extended health plan. That's correct. And cosmetics could also fall under dermatology, depending on the assessment, treatment, diagnosis that that um, is presented at the time of your visit. So if, in fact, you're wanting some kind of procedural base that's not covered under OHIP or UHIP, then it's considered cosmetics and you'd have to pay out of pocket for that. I also popped the link in the chat for folks who are interested in finding a uh, primary care um, practitioner, okay? Yeah, the links are also included within our presentation. Uh, so again, we'll provide that to everybody at the end. Alrighty, if there are no other questions, um, I'm just going to highlight the references. So these are some of the resources we used when creating this presentation. They are a wealth of knowledge. So if you have more questions about the Canadian healthcare system, these websites are Health Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, and the Ontario Health Regulators website. So they will answer most of your questions quite in depth. So take a look at these when you have a chance. And then other resources that we have um, are, you know, a patient's guide to the Ontario healthcare system, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and the College of Nurses, which highlights the nurse practitioner's role. The first resource, especially, I shared that with me a little while ago, and it was great. It answered almost every question I have as a patient in Ontario now. So definitely take a look at it. It's a great resource. And I will pass it back over to our York International staff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, presenters, for such an informative session. I personally learned a lot today. So thank you. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, you will be getting an email with these slides of today's workshop, links for the upcoming events that I would be talking about next, and a feedback form asking you questions on your experience on today's workshop. Now I'll take a moment and talk about the upcoming events at York International. Uh, winters can be hard and depressing, and the academic stress sometimes makes it exhausting for all of us. Therefore, taking breaks from time to time is essential. And to come join us in person at our coffee break on January 26th from 2 to 4 p.m. And get a chance to connect with your peers and meet new people. And since today we talked about navigating the Canadian health system and if in case you have any follow-up questions that you missed asking today, this is an event, this event on 1st February is your chance to get them answered. If you are an undergrad student, you can ask about uh, UHIP. And if you're a grad student, you can get a chance to connect, connect with UGSA for your extended health insurance plans. And you can drop in at any time of, at our health clinic from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Also, we would be having some snacks, giveaways throughout the event. So we hope to see you there. And moreover, uh, there would be free, uh, free flu shots and COVID vaccines. It is a great way to get up to date on your vaccines at your own convenience. And lastly, York International is also hosting a workshop in partnership with Career Center for students to learn on how to network at events, build your elevator pitch uh, through hands-on activities, and gain tips and strategies on improving your professional communication skills. It, it is an event on February 8th from 2 to 4 p.m. And the best part about this event is that it is virtual, so you can attend at your own convenience at and in your own comfort clothes. 
So, and York International believes in constant improvements. Um, and we, as an office, uh, wants to make uh, the events as better as we can. So therefore, we highly appreciate your feedback. So if you could take a moment to scan the QR code and let us know how we did today and what can be improved for the future events. Also, please, uh, I would request you to take some time and follow us on social media so you can be extra updated with our future events and activities. And lastly, I would like to thank you all for attending the event. And we hope that you have a great semester ahead and stay warm.